Thank you, Toby, for the invitation and Dean Filler as well uh, for inviting me here. You know, I was on the inaugural advisory committee for Drexel Law School in 2006. So I, so I feel a lot of pride for your accomplishments and also uh, take some credit for the success, of course. So I definitely appreciate the invitation. I uh, want to share a couple things today. Uh, first, I'm gonna share my uh, journey into public service and later into the corporate world. And then on top of that, share some thoughts on how I think about public service and how hopefully those, some of those thoughts can fit into uh, your own thinking about your own journey into public service. So I'll start by sharing that I think our sense of direction can be shaped by a lot of different things, right? It could be shaped by an event, by a tragedy, by an early experience. And for me, it was definitely early experience uh, that shaped my direction into, into public service. So I'll tell you that when I was born in the 60s uh, in Puerto Rico, my parents were already living in the city of San Juan. They were college professors in their 30s and they had some big dreams and they moved my family to New York City so that my dad could complete his PhD. So we had a great middle-class life and we came back to Puerto Rico <coughs> at the age of seven, but I was uh, really affected by how different the world was when we would visit my grandparents in the small town of Hajuya in the center of the island. So just as an example, very early in the morning, uh, some men who looked very poor would be sitting outside my grandmother's house and they would pick coffee all day in mm. aluminum cans. They would dump them in the, the coffee in the sack, keep picking. And then at the end, my grandparents would pay them. Uh, she would give them food all day, all the foods she provided, all the meals she provided and all the food they needed. And uh, she would cure them if they were sick. Um, it was a, a, a dynamic that was, uh, you know, different and interesting to me. And, you know, as I later understood, she was also poor. She wasn't as poor as those men and their families, but she was still poor. She sold her coffee to the government for very little money. So she, she was kind of a back-end producer and they had land and food, but they didn't have cash. They never owned a car. Uh, my grandfather could not re read or write, he did math. She had a big intellect though, my grandmother did. And so she really understood that for her seven kids, there were limited choices. They could get a high school degree. She only went to the fourth grade and they could, you know, maybe have a good job in the government or she could really push them hard into higher ed. And so that's what she did in enormous, sacrificing in enormous ways. She put pretty much all her kids and pushed them through uh, to get uh, higher education. So my mom, who was poorer than my dad growing up, didn't speak about her past. She was embarrassed by it, frankly. But my grandmother was really proud of the life that she lived and uh, she was poor, but she shared so generously. And I would see that and observe it. And people would come from far away to visit her, to get advice, to eat her food, to bring their, her, their kids if they were sick because they thought she could help cure them. Um, she was incredibly charismatic and she was the first amazing public servant that I ever met. Uh, and, and the best perhaps ever, and she never got paid a dime for it. So I believe that my passion for this type of work and this type of journey came from what I witnessed and how it made me feel, right? Importantly, how it made me feel. So at 19, as Adine mentioned, I decided to go to law school and like all teenagers, I wanted to be as far away from my parents as I could. So I decided to go to Georgetown. Also Georgetown offered me uh, a scholarship that paid half my tuition. So that was uh, a game changer right there. But in any event, uh, at Georgetown isn't particularly public service oriented, um, but I had some amazing clinical experiences working in the DC community and on different uh, justice issues. And during the year I worked in a law firm, during the summer of my second year, I worked in an organization called Florida Rural Legal Services in Immokalee, not far from where I am right now in Naples. Um, and I worked there, I got to represent uh, 
political refugees from Guatemala and migrant workers from Haiti and other places. And um, that contrast between those two experiences made me realize what was right for me. I'll tell you what I found, I found the sense of purpose, the sense of freedom was different. Uh, the sense of significance, you know, every day you show up, you do something, you feel like it actually makes a difference. The other interesting thing is that I got so much more responsibility when I was in this uh, summer job in rural Florida. And, you know, it's, it wasn't necessarily because I was brilliant, right, because I was a 20 or 21 year old kid, really, but it's because there was so much work to be done that they handed to you. If you're willing to do it and you have the capacity to learn and grow into it, uh, they'll give you the work. So uh, after that, it was clear to me that that's the work I needed to do. And I ended up in, in uh, community legal services where uh, one of the great things that I, um, that I got from there was meeting Toby. But I will mention community legal services for those of you that you know, may or may not know them as well as some of us do. Uh, even back then in 1985 had an amazing reputation of being super focused on uh, high impact litigation, which many, many uh, legal services programs shied away from. They were you know, afraid of rocking the boat. So that was a you know, really big honor to join CLS. It was very competitive. So there I worked in employment uh, and public benefits law. And I remember you know, when I hit 100 cases and then at one point I had 200 cases and I had a lot of support around me though of really brilliant lawyers and paralegals that really helped me succeed. And, um, and many of those paralegals themselves have become lawyers and are really outstanding lawyers in the city and in other places today. Um, so an example of the kind of empowering environment that one has in uh, the public service arena is that I had a case I made it to the Third Circuit on appeal. It was strange that it got there. It wasn't that complicated a case, it was an attorney fee case. Um, but in any event, uh, the, the managing attorney that was helping me on it, you know, was the natural person to make the argument, right? But he let me do it. He allowed me to deliver that argument. I was 23 years old. It was an amazing experience. Um, they also uh, said, to me, look, you can make this job anything you want it to be, so long as you meet our expectations of quality service to these 200 clients, you can do anything you want. And so that's what I did. I took full advantage of that opportunity and took on some bilingual education cases, built a domestic violence program with some colleagues, uh, challenged city council on a redistricting case as a co-counsel. Some of you may remember there was a uh, a period of time, it may have been a couple of months where city council didn't get paid because they had to uh, rewrite this uh, redistricting legislation. So I was involved in that case. It was pretty magical. And uh, the reason why I ended up moving on from practicing law is because I realized that being a lawyer requires a degree of patience that I did not have at that point in my life, right? Maybe now I would have more, but this whole notion of waiting to be heard you know, I, I just didn't think there was enough time to be waiting around to be heard. So, so I looked for new opportunities. And um, one of those opportunities turned out to be something that I, you know, pursued and got. There was a famous uh, journalist in, in Philly called Juan Gonzalez, who relocated to New York. And a lot of people in the Latino community were upset that he had not been replaced. And so I wrote to the Daily News editor, Rich Argood, and said, hey, I can write, I'll write a column. And he brought me in, we had a great conversation. And just like that, overnight, I became the Latino opinion columnist for the Daily News. I would do it every couple, every couple of weeks. I wouldn't do it as much as Juan did. <clears throat> they even paid me a little bit of money for it. And uh, CLS let me do it. So that's another really interesting example of the empowerment culture that one can have in a, uh, when one is in, in the right public service organization. Uh, so one column I wrote about was about this Latino agency that was in a deep crisis because um, it had a big budget back then, a one and a half million dollar budget, um, but the director was under federal investigation and had been fired for corruption. 
So I made the argument that the, the organization should be saved. It was in the poorest zip code in Pennsylvania. Basically, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Make a long story short, I ended up being invited to speak to the board. And I eventually became uh, the CEO of that organization uh, during its darkest period and scariest days. So not a very uh, smart career move in the eyes of many. But uh, when I joined Congreso, you know, at 29, I became responsible for a troubled enterprise, but an enterprise nonetheless with 70 employees, thousands of clients, broken trust with the community, multiple state and federal investigations. And so I had the responsibility of turning it around. And so what I learned is that if you ask the right questions, you get the facts you need, you're open to advice and surround yourself with the right people uh, and learn how to take decisive action, uh, you can pretty much get yourself out of any situation that has a solution ahead of it, right? So, so um, the amount of learning that I was able to do in that, upper, in that job was incredible. And we also did some transformational work as far as the social impact side, building uh, training programs with corporations and unions, establishing the first Latino domestic violence program in Philadelphia, uh, raising money for a headquarters that, you know, created kind of a, the kind of space that we would want to be served by. That's what I thought our community should have. So things like that, you know, really magical stuff. I did that work for um, seven years. And uh, after seven years, the next mayor in the city, uh, John Street, asked me to join his administration. And so I did so as the Commissioner of Human Services, as the Dean mentioned. And, you know, a lot of people told me he's right not to take the job. But, you know, I was surprised that they would say that because this is the kind of job that we always say somebody should go in and do well, right? So it was an opportunity to, go, to step in and try to make a difference. But, you know, essentially they said that because it is a job that could kill your career. It's very hard, you know, to be in, in that kind of job and not have to face a tragedy at some point, right? And historically organizations kind of turn in and retrench and uh, get defensive and things don't turn out well. Um, but in any event, um, it was amazing as an experience and I uh, highly recommend government as a step in any career. Uh, I went from running a $10 million organization at that point, uh, Congreso had grown that far and has grown much more since, to running a, a $600 million operating department, the largest in the city. And so there I encountered different challenges, right? It's a uh, you can't really just turn over your staff, you have to reinvigorate your staff. So I really worked on kind of elevating the focus of, of attention on the, on the social work staff at DHS, at the same time, gaining clarity about who's the client here, right? The client is the child, right? We're not the client, we're not the victim, they're the victim, and our job is to, is to solve problems. Um, so we did a lot of transformational work there, right? We changed policies that needed to be changed, some small, some very big. We shifted millions of dollars, 100 million to be exact, into prevention so that we weren't waiting around, you know, like, uh, you know, a fireman until there was a fire and then go in and rescue the kid. No, let's, let's, let's work on that, you know, much earlier in the journey. And, and another type of policy change that one can do that doesn't cost a lot of money, but who knows how many families it kept together, is creating a, a fund, an emergency fund that social workers could tap without bureaucracy to prevent poverty-driven out-of-home placements, which those of you that have worked in child welfare know that, oh my God, sometimes it's like there's no air conditioning and it's 100 degrees or the refrigerator broke and there's no food, right? So it could be like a few hundred dollars could keep a family together. So we created stuff like that. And that was magical. The longer term accomplishments, performance-based contracting and foster care, you know, things like creating and achieving independence center for young people who are aging out. Um, fundamentally, one can make incredible change in government while, uh, growing a lot as well. So um, DHS is a burnout job. So after a few years, I did go and run the United Way, which is, I won't spend a lot of time on the United Way, but it is uh, the largest fundraising organization in the, in the region. And during that time, you know, one of the things that I had to learn there was working with the corporate community, 
right? There is, uh, there's a lot of corporate involvement in United Way uh, because that's what the model is. It's working, bringing the community together with the corporate sector. And so I was really amazed about, uh, about how data-driven and outcomes-oriented some of those corporate leaders were. Not all, but you know, some of them were really passionate about that. And some of those leaders weren't from Vanguard. Vanguard leaders were also very passionate about community. Um, and when they showed up, they showed up big. So I was really impressed by that. And so I actually, at, some, at one point after we had been growing the campaign for a few years, reached out to uh, my, my board member and friend at the moment, CEO of Vanguard, and said, look, I'm interested in making a change. Um, is there an opportunity at Vanguard for me? And he did an amazing thing. He actually gave me the shot. You know, he believed that I have the leadership capabilities to come in and learn what I needed to learn. And, uh, and that's what happened for the last 12 years. I've been at Vanguard. I've led four different functions. And um, the largest one I did for five years, which is running the retail services business, which has 1,400 crew members, which is what we call our employees, uh, 7 million retail clients, and 700 billion in assets under management. So, uh, you know, I've done some amazing opportunities there. And I have learned so much about how to learn, how, uh, how complex organizations run, how to drive change inside large corporations, um, how amazing capabilities are, and sometimes how they're wasted, right? And they're underutilized. Um, but I do want to share this, and then I'm going to move to sort of share some lessons learned um, and some thoughts on public service and my career. And then more than anything, I'm interested in hearing about your journey and, and what you have to say. But some things I want to share is about Vanguard, where I have um, been successful and, and I'm one of the top 60 leaders who run a $7 trillion company of 19,000 people. I'll tell you, I would not be where I am today had I not taken the path of public service work that I did. Because when I graduated from law school, I mean, I didn't really have skills. I didn't come from a family of lawyers. I didn't come from a family of business people. I didn't come from a family of corporate people. None of that, none of that was accessible to me. I did not have that knowledge. I did not even know that that was knowledge to be gotten. I mean, that's the level. And so public service for me was about opening one door after another, after another, after another. And, you know, I guess my personal characteristic is that I'm not afraid to go through it, right? But other than that, it is that being in things that matter with people that care about the same things you do and getting things done that I think opened, you know, up my skill set and my ability to go anywhere anywhere. I believe I could go into any organization in any industry and make a difference. I really truly do. And, um, and it's because of that journey, right? It is that journey. So what are my closing thoughts here? So first of all, let's talk about what public service is. To me, it's about doing something meaningful to positively benefit others outside of ourselves, our friends and family. Right, it is about going outside of ourselves, about crossing some sort of <clears throat> line into the other things that we care about, right? And we care about enough to go in there and do something. Um, it's about impact. It's about having impact, and it's also to me now in my life something that I, perhaps I didn't think about as much before. It's about integration. It's not necessarily about sacrifice. It's about balance. I'm not saying that one doesn't work hard, but one works hard in the private sector too. <clears throat> Trust me, sometimes for, with less satisfaction or less reward, ultimately. But it's about integration of things in life. Um, it can be, for example, a way to achieve fulfillment, purpose, meaning, and balance. I would say, uh, in all honesty, that the last 12 years at Vanguard have been amazing growth years and Vanguard is an amazing company. I'm a client and I will always be a client and I highly recommend it as, you know, the best company out there in what we do. But I think it's the years where I've struggled the most with a sense of purpose, meaning and fulfillment. I mean, that's just an honest, uh, the honest truth. And it's also made me very, you know, successful in other ways. 
um, you know, financially, I'll say, and that's, that's, that's true, but there's, there's a price that one pays um, for that. And so that's why I believe that the answer is absolutely to uh, pursue balance. Uh, I don't think it's full time for everybody necessarily, but I do think it is for everybody. If you focus on the right thing in a way that works for you. So what does public service uh, and public se sector life give? I would say from everything I've seen, freedom. It gives you more freedom than being in the private sector. Okay, it's not one, one's not better or, or, or worse. I'm just saying, hey, there's some benefits and, and trade-offs to think about. Freedom to create, to drive change, to innovate is greater in public service than in the private sector. That's Alba Martinez's personal opinion. The diversity of people and experiences, the opportunities to travel uncharted territory, you know, and grow and be in things that haven't been traveled and that you get to create. Uh, the sense of appreciation and being valued is for what you do and your effort is greater in the public sector than in the private sector. Private sector work uh, can be financially rewarding um, for sure. Um, but it can become insular and you can feel somewhat disconnected. Um, your pursuit, I believe, should be about personal passion and purpose. I think money follows success and I believe that success follows passion, right? So let me say that again. I think that whatever you do, follow your personal passion and purpose because money follows success and success follows passion. And I'll close by saying that public service is a magical career to follow as a lawyer. If that is your passion, you will grow a lot. And if you are successful and remain open to growth and opportunity, there is no question, and I'm a living example of that, that you can be personally fulfilled and financially successful in your career.